All right, I just want to welcome everyone to our November edition of ITS Michigan's uh, webinar series. Uh, we, uh, again, I'm masked today uh, because I am in the office and uh, we're trying to take care of uh, the city of Detroit as, as well as we can. Um, thank you very much for joining us here today from the safety of your own offices or homes. We're very excited about today's uh, webinar because it goes through something that's very near and dear to our hearts as traffic and transportation engineers in terms of revitalizing high resolution data uh, presented by uh, Joshua Fink from Econolite. Before I introduce our uh, speaker and the topic itself in more detail, I just wanted again to thank you for being such great supporters of ITS Michigan and for uh, be being here today. I do also want to remind you that we are very active on social media. So if you go to our website, you can find all the links to our social media accounts. Uh, and we do try to update our events quite regularly. And you can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube through those links. Feel free to, to join there. And we also have a very uh, active newsletter that does cover all the events that are, are happening within our chapter. Uh, with that said, I would like to uh, introduce our session. Um, before I do that, one, one final thing is I would kindly ask you to mute yourselves. Um, usually on Zoom, Alt-A uh, is a shortcut for, for muting your, your microphone. Um, and if, you, if you'd like to unmute, you can press Alt-A again and speak. I will leave it up to Josh when he starts to uh, kind of try to moderate how questions are coming in. We do have a chat box that you can uh, actively engage with. And I just wrote here, so you guys can see where the chat box shows up. Feel free to type in your questions during the presentation. And if Josh doesn't mind, if you want to inter you know, uh, interject with your question, otherwise, please do type your question in and we'll address them in a and A section at the end. With that said, I'd like uh, to introduce the topic. Today's topic is revi uh, revisiting high resolution data. It's a case studies and solutions that um, Josh is going to be presenting. Recent developments in traffic signal operations, research and development have pushed the envelope of what data can uh, we can collect from traffic signal controllers at the street. With communications and detection systems in place, we can collect rich data sets that tell the story in detail how existing operations are managing traffic. But our investments are in data focused technology worthwhile for an agency. I know we on our end, we try to we exhibit that quite a bit in terms of the questions that we're saying, how much do we invest into uh, data into technology uh, to produce this data. This presentation will detail the fundamental concepts of the high resolution data enumeration standards developed by the Purdue University and their associated signal performance metrics, along with a variety of case studies and examples of using these data to improve traffic operations. Our presenter today is Joshua Fink, a traffic engineer with Econolite. He's located in Southeast Michigan. His chief uh, responsibilities include working with Econolite's local Michigan distributor, Carrier and Gable. Josh works closely with all deployments of Centrax around the state of Michigan to ensure agencies can maximize the system effectiveness. Josh previously spent four years with AECOM where he worked extensively with Macomb County Department of Roads Traffic Operations Center. Josh brings his engineering skills and expertise to Econolite, having received his bachelor's and master's in civil engineering from Michigan State University and West, uh, Western Michigan University, respectively. Josh is passionate about traffic, the traffic industry, and always strives to find data-driven, uh, localized solutions for local challenges. I want to welcome Josh here, and uh, Josh is not only um, a colleague, but he's also um, a very well uh, versed. He's very well versed in traffic, and I'm super excited about hearing what he has to present to us today. Josh, with that, I pass it on to you. Thanks so much, Tony. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, absolute pleasure to see all the all the familiar names and faces we've got on the call today. Um, for those of you that don't know me too well, really looking forward to getting to know you um, in the uh, coming coming months here. here. Hope I get a chance to work with all, all, all of you guys at some point. Um, if you don't know me that well, um, I am a certified traffic geek, and that will become incredibly obvious as we go through this presentation here. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. We'll go ahead and jump right in. Uh, Tony, hopefully that came up, and I'm going into full screen mode now. Uh, yes, it's showing up. Uh... 
All right, fantastic. Um, yeah, so wanted to talk to you guys today about um, a concept very near, 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 dear to my heart: high resolution data that we can get off of traffic signal controllers. Um, with regards to Q and A, usually I don't mind. Um, you know, if we, we if we pause for questions here and there, but I think in this particular case, we'll uh, save all the questions for the end here. Um, and I'll go through the presentation, and we can open up to a, a bit of an open discussion here. Um, Always like to, to start off a little bit. Um, if you're if you're not familiar with Econolite, um, we've been around since 1933. Uh, the story goes that uh, somebody at some point had a very smart idea of putting a flashing light on top of a uh, stop sign and put that into the middle of a very busy downtown Los An Angeles intersection, and it happened to tra uh, manage traffic a lot better than the bedlam that was th uh, that was there previously, uh, and that became the first Econo light. And things kind of built up from there. Uh, looking forward to today, we are still based in Southern California. Our headquarters are in Anaheim. Uh, we do have offices throughout the US as well as a fairly large presence in Canada. And we have uh, some of our manufacturing facilities down in Mexico as well. Um, we've got just shy of about 800 employees. Um, our, our footprint is primarily in the US and North America at large, uh, but we do have uh, some world, world, worldwide presence as well. Um, I think where we are at this point, the fact I heard recently was that uh, something like one third of all uh, signalized intersections in the U United States have some piece of uh, equipment that came from us, whether it's the cabinet, the traffic controller, or one of the uh, sensor or detector or management systems associated with it. So uh, pretty, pretty cool to be uh, a part of a company like this for me personally. Um, I, as uh, I, I, Tony alluded to, um, I deal a lot with um, our ATMS offering, Centrax. Um, we've had that around um, as our flagship offering since about 2009. Um, and since then, we have, um, I think we're actually in excess of about 320 uh, deployed Centrax systems across the US and North, North America. And um, al alongside that, we also have um, a fair amount of uh, adaptive systems and then some uh, development and support staff to go, to go behind that. Um, uh, we do have several active uh, deployment projects here in the state of Michigan, along with um, a couple up and running systems as well. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been really, really cool to be able to move from the Macomb TOC, where I was an active user of Centrax, into my role at Econ like now, where I get to not only help see what the future development is for the platform, but also as, assist um, you know, be, being able to install, deploy, and then start to use this for other um, agencies around, around the state and around the country as well. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. I um, want to start with uh, going back in time a little bit, back to 2012. This is a screenshot I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. Uh, this gets used all the time, but um, if you're not familiar with it, there was a National Traffic Signal Report Card that was put together back in 2012. And the general idea was, let's do a self-assessment across the industry, um, have agencies of varying sizes um, uh, and uh, geographic ranges answer a series of questions that just kind of amount to, how are you guys handling and managing your traffic grid right now? And so there are a bunch of uh, questions uh, uh, that, that, that kind of went into that overall theme. And the uh, entity that put this, put this together wanted to kind of uh, categorize that into a, into a couple different areas and give it an, an overall letter grade. And that's kind of the result of the screenshot that we have here. Uh, and you can see overall, the grades weren't all that great back in 2012. Overall, a D plus. Uh, the one that I'll circle in particular here is that F for traffic monitoring and data collection. And overall, what you can kind of take away from this is there's, there's kind of two primary questions that arise. Why are the letter grades like this? And also, what can we do about it? Um, moving forward, um, in March of this year, there was an update released uh, uh, to that particular report card. If you missed it, well, there were only a couple things going on around, around the country in March of uh, this year. So if you, if you missed it, I think that's OK. Um, but in general, um, what we kind of take a look at if we dive into that uh, uh, report is um, uh, NOCO and I, I, ITE wanted to refresh the, met the methodology for uh, that, that 2012 survey and kind of build on it as well as previous iterations of it. Um, and they, they wanted to make that, that self-assessment survey a little bit more, more detailed, have a, have a couple extra different um, cat categories uh, to, to divide um, answers into. They also wanted to attach this um, overall like management description um, uh, char characteristic to each of those answers that ranges from um, a level one, which is kind of the equivalent of we only, we only do a particular operation, particular routine if it happens to come up. Otherwise, we don't pay attention to it at all whatsoever. All the way up to level four, which is considered managed, uh, which can, can kind of be translated as 
This is a core fundamental of our operation. We do this every single day. So we got a little bit of extra information and detail out of it. So it's not quite apples to apples comparison with the 2012 because some of the methodology did change, but you can do a pretty decent approximation of where we were eight years ago versus where we are now. And you can see in the, in the middle of the screen here that overall grade, we did, we did go up. We went from a D plus to a C plus. Um, so we're, we're making improvements, but maybe we're not making improvements as fast as we had hoped. Maybe we're not making the right improvements. You know, a, 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 a lot of goals, a lot of, a lot of um, understanding come out of that, that, that 2012 survey. And so from here, we kind of want to start to ask the question, you know, what, what are we falling short on? And I want to dive into just a couple of details of that particular report. It is actually a pretty fun read, um, you know, but I say that as a traffic geek, so take that with a grain, grain of salt. But um, one, one of the particular things I like to call out from this is there was an, a series of questions related to the overall performance management of a particular agency. Uh, you know, just, just kind of asking you know, how, uh, how good is your understanding of what your current op op operations are? How do you guys believe that you, you perform and what are you, what are you using to measure that? And based on the 144 agencies that responded to this particular survey, that averaged out to a grade of C or in that FHWA category, a level two. And ultimately that comes out uh, to the outcome and output measures and methods are established to evaluate the effectiveness of the program and the performance of the system, but we still have limitations in systems and technology in order to increase that overall. And on the left side of the screen here, I've got a quote called out, only 36% of agencies function at an established level of ma ma maturity. That established level indicates that level two. So even, even the folks that, that we, we are able to, to have a very clear understanding of where we are, we still only have kind of a limited sample size of, 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 of those in, in particular. Um, one other call out I'd like to bring up from this uh, report here, um, there was a, a series of questions related to how does an agency identify particular operational issues? If we can see from the blue chart here, almost every single agency out there that responded to this has some kind of uh, function for the public to call in and um, you know, uh, deliver a complaint about a particular traffic signal, ask a, ask a question, some kind of interface between the maintaining traffic agency and the public is now in place, which is, which is really good. As a, as a public agency, um, you know, we, we want to be able to take in that feedback from our everyday you know, motorist users. Um, but what that also gets us into is that a lot of agencies rely on that particular function and we kind of get into this reactive approach. This may be the only interface in which particular agencies have to help them identify particular issues occurring in, in the field. And I've got a call out on the left here. Uh, the results suggest the majority of operational issues are identified reactively and they could exist days, weeks, or months before they are identified and corrected. And the reason for that is ultimately because Unless somebody calls in and says, hey, uh, this pedestrian push button is no longer working, or I used to get a flashing yellow arrow here, and now it's only a green arrow, or this intersection has been, flash has, has been flashing for weeks, what's going on? Without that information and feedback, a particular agency may never have vis 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 visibility on it. If you see the purple uh, bar in the middle of the graph, we see 75% of reporting agencies have some kind of preventative maintenance uh, routine that can be used and is incredibly helpful to capture a lot of those operational issues. But even that is still, you know, a little bit lower than where we would we would we would like like to be. No, number one and number two, um, obviously there's a, there's a lot of labor and a lot of cost and a lot of um, you know regular uh, schedules that have to be kept in order to have that be truly effective. And obviously the larger size the system gets, the the greater the geographic area, the more challenging that that becomes. So the one that I look at here is this yellow bar, where only 41% of um, reporting agencies have any kind of automated monitoring routine. To me, this is really where we want to identify what technology can we provide agencies with that is a worthy investment to increase this. And this is where we kind of talk about, let's have the system work for us. If I have some kind of system in place that's going to automatically tell me when a signal is in flash, if I have a system that can automatically identify if I have a broken vehicle or pedestrian detector, um, or if there's any other kind of operational issue out there and have that report to me as soon as it happens, then that allows me as the agency to be a, a, a lot more flexible and a lot more capable of, of, of deploying the maintenance staff that we have on hand to fix that particular issue. And obviously that ultimately gets back into providing a much better and more fav 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 favorable experience for the motoring public. So ultimately, the question that I, that I asked from this is, okay, we see that where agencies are, we have, we have tools in place where we 
we can understand and identify issues out there, but we're still kind of in that reactive mode. So the question I ask then is, how can agencies become more proactive instead of reactive? The other conclusion that we can kind of draw from that is that ultimately our traditional methods need, need, need to improve. We have a lot of gaps in, in understanding what our operational issues are. We only have 41% of um, those reporting agencies that have any kind of system that can audit, uh, you know, automatically monitor the system for us. So how do we start to improve what we've, what, what, what's always been the same status quo and start to move that forward into worthwhile investments at the agency level? So go back about 10 years or so, um, and uh, the fine folks down at Purdue Uni University wanted to team up uh, on a G GTRP program uh, that was uh, sponsored by the Indiana Department of Transportation, and really wanted to start to do a lot of research into this. Um, in particular, some of the focus areas of research there was, you know, can we, can we identify ways in which we can I, I, you know, really truly dive into how efficiently are my signals operating? Can we start to identify which of my signals would benefit from retiming? And can we automate that signal retiming process? And that, that really started to form a lot of what that research was. And the initial element that came out of that research to what I would call landmark doc documents were uh, um, uh, I re re released, which I've got the title pages for here. Uh, these two documents outline not only a lot of the concepts for that high resolution data that we'll get into in much more detail here shortly, but also how businesses and agencies can start to use these as well. And what this has allowed us to do is we started to move away from those traditional methods and really start to harness the investments into technology that we've made and the ones that we want to make as well. If we can collect more data from the field, if we can get more information and truly understand how our signals are handling traffic and now start to chart that across um, you know, at, at, a, at a signal level, at a corridor level, at a network level, we're going to have a much deeper understanding of where our weak, weaknesses are, where our strengths are, where do we want to target um, investments and, um, you know, provide additional resources for. And the blueprints that Purdue laid out really, really give you a very, very good approach to how we can do that. And that, that kind of gets into the concept of high resolution data. So the question I get asked the next is, well, what is this high resolution data? And in a nutshell, Effectively, what we're doing now that we hadn't done before is we is the, the modern ATC traffic controller. Um, that would be the Econolite Cobalt, the Siemens model, model 60, so on and so forth. What these controllers have the capability of doing is recording different events that occur throughout the life of a, of a traffic signal controller at the tenth of a second level. So this, this can be information like when does detector five turn on? When does detector five turn off? When does phase two turn green, yellow, and red? When do we start transition between pattern one and pattern two? And when do we finish transition? So on and so forth. And there's, I think, I think it's up to 85 or 95 different um, uh, versions of this type of data that we're recording at that extreme minute level. So if you kind of zoom out, if we're, if, if we're getting you know, up, uh, upwards of you know, data every tenth of a second, you zoom that out to a 24 hour window, what that gives us is, a, is an incredibly rich data set that can really tell a very complete story of how did this signal handle traffic on this particular day. So what I've got up on the screen here is kind of a accompaniment to the uh, research documents I had on the previous slide. Uh, this is the JTRP document that kind of outlines and defines what each of those data elements are. Um, we've got both the descriptor, a particular parameter. This is where we're going to identify what particular phase it is or what particular detector it is, and ultimately the description of what this particular data bit is being used for. All of this gets translated into how the controller stores things. And what we want to do is be able to capture all of that data, bring it back to some kind of cent central system, analyze it, and ultimately have a way that we have a much deeper understanding of how these traffic signal systems are working. So ultimately, this is a different type of data. Uh, you know, if you if you kind of look historically, you know, we're looking at volume counts. We might have um, a you know intern out on out on the street corner um, that is going to have that counting board. We need to count count cars. Uh, we might get some basic oc occupancy data from a loop detector, and ultimately it's all going to be put into 15-minute buckets. And in some, some, some cases, sometimes those contracts can get particularly difficult, and so we see a lot of agencies may only want to refresh this information three, five, seven, ten years. Compare that to what we're able to get off the high-resolution high data, where now we've, uh, because of the technology investments that we've made into the ATC controller, we can get such rich data um, every single day. So what that gives us now is a much, much more in-depth picture of what um, our traffic signals are doing, and we don't have to wait those every, every couple of years to refresh that, that volume information. 
What does this look like in detail? Well, if you were to pull some of this information off of a controller, this is approximately what you're, you're gonna, gonna get. So it's a, lot of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of numbers, but ultimately we see we've got a timestamp, we've got an event code that's identifying what that particular um, data enumeration uh, event is, and then any, any parameter associated with it. And this all gets translated into me understanding now that phase six at this particular intersection turned green at uh, 3 p.m. and six tenths of, 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 of a second. So there's a lot of really good information there. How do we end up using this then? So if we can kind of start to correlate you know, if I can understand the exact point in time when a detector turns on, and I also know exactly what that traffic signal is doing as far as the color that it's displaying throughout the entire day, we can start to chart that. So what I what I have here is, you know, if we if we zoom way in and look at one particular cycle, I might see the length of red that I've got because I know exactly when the when the signal turned red. I know exactly when that face turns green, and I know exactly when that face turns turns yellow. I want to correlate those times, those those timestamps to when we had vehicles arrive. And we know the vehicles are arriving because we know exactly when that detector turns on and when it turns off again. So, so through here, I can see through a bunch of black diamonds, I had a bunch of uh, vehicles arriving in the red. I had a couple uh, diamonds arriving in the, in the green, and then I had one, one guy that went through uh, in the uh, yellow. If we start to build that up over time, we can start to see now, what are we looking at from cycle by cycle? I can see how many vehicles are now arriving when that signal's al already red. I can see how many vehicles are getting through on the programmed split uh, and, and timing parameters that I have. And I can start to compare, am I, am, do I ultimately have more vehicles arriving on red or do I have more vehicles actually getting through uh, without stopping? If you zoom this out all the way to an entire day's worth, you get what's called the Purdue coordination diagram. I told you I was a traffic geek. I'm gonna tell you this is one of my favorite graphs I've, I've ever seen because it tells you the full picture. What we're taking a look at here is First off, an extremely ideal condition here, but ultimately between the bottom of the graph and that spiking green curve, those are all my vehicles arriving on red. And you can see there's not a lot of those dots in there. Overall, this signal is performing well because I can also correlate that to all of those black dots between the green line and the red line are all my vehicles arriving on green. They're able to go through that signal. They don't stop at all. I can, I can tell a couple other bits of information here. Uh, if you look at the far left and a little bit on the far right there, that red line is spiking quite uh, quite drastically. I know that, that that is where I'm running free mode. Those are my those are my free mode hours because I don't have a fixed force off point. Whereas if I take a look throughout the hours between 5:30 a.m. and 11:30 uh, you know, p.m., I've got you know, much more, for lack of a better term, calm red lines. And what this is this is this is basically telling me is these are the different cycles. These are the different patterns that I'm running throughout throughout the day. So the more I zoom in, I can now start to see what of my patterns are operating really efficiently, what of my patterns aren't operating um, really efficiently. And as a traffic engineer, I can then zoom in and go, okay, I can see that pattern two, for example, uh, maybe I have more vehicles arriving on red than some of my other patterns are. Is there something that I can do about those particular operations? And what reports like this will do is really start to spur in a lot of those questions and say, what do we need to do to fix traffic here? One thing to note, I don't want to get into the equipment a whole lot today, but I do want to know a system like this is extremely detection driven. Um, depending on the level of detection we have at a particular intersection, that's going to drive what metrics we're able to get. Uh, there are some metrics in which we can show you if we don't have any detection system at, at all out there. Yep, we can still tell this signal is still still ticking. Uh, it's not in flash. We know what patterns it's running. We don't have any operational issues. If we have just stop bar detection, we can start to get into a little bit more detailed data. And I'll kind of show what that looks like here in a couple slides. And then if we do have that advanced detection, whether that's 200, 300, 400 feet out, that's where we really start to get that incredibly rich data set. And we can do things like my beloved Purdue coordination diagram and a couple other metrics that go along, along with it. So just a quick note on that. These are not systems that can be just done in a, in a vacuum, um, but wanted to at least hi highlight that. So those are kind of the fundamental elements. Um, I want to get into some of the some of the ways that we can use all of this in, in information and some of the data data driven solutions. Ultimately, just as a quick refresher, the goal here ultimately are these investments that agencies can make that's going to drive them from being a more reactive agency waiting for the call to come in to a more proactive agency understanding what operational issues are are out there so we can jump on it, fix it, and and have an overall po more positive experience for the motoring public. That's ultimately the goal here. So let's go into a couple examples here. How can we solve problems with data? 
Uh, so as an example, um, let's say we get a motorist concern calling in about this, this particular three-legged three uh, intersection. Uh, motorist says uh, that the school signal was stopping traffic during non-business hours. Uh, this is a real world situation. I can tell you as I took the call myself, uh, that this uh, pr particular gentleman was saying that he was getting stopped at this signal heading southbound at about three in the morning. That driveway there only serves a school. So his question was, why am I getting stopped at this particular signal even though school isn't in session right now? Perfectly valid, valid question. Taking a look at the um, uh, records that Macomb County had with the school district, uh, the school had requested, don't put the signal into flash. So that right off, off the bat answers the question, okay, well, we can't do the, the simplistic solution of let's just put the signal into flash at three, three in the morning because it's a school signal. So we have to keep it running. So at that point, let's do a field, field review. What are we actually seeing out there? At that point, what we were able to determine is um, there is a left turn uh, actuated loop below the pavement in that red circle at the bottom of the screenshot that was just a little bit too close to that center line. And what it was resulting in is uh, traffic heading southbound could be just, just close enough to that loop that it would trigger that detector. If you're familiar with loop operations, you know that as soon as we have any kind of detection in that, in that loop environment, we have to lock that call into the controller and guarantee service. So what we were ultimately seeing is that because somebody was triggering that left turn loop, we would stop southbound traffic, switch to a, a left turn green light. That way we could service the northbound left turn into that school. So my question from here is, okay, we've identified the situation, but is this, is this worth spending our resources on to fix? Is this a systemic issue or was this a particular one-time thing that we don't necessarily need, need to worry about? So that's where we kind of take a look at the data. That's what this chart looks like here. What I basically said is let's use our existing resources within Centrax and when, within our advanced traffic controllers to take a look at show me every single time that northbound left turn phase went green, which is my phase one. So I pulled that information out of our Centrax system for uh, about a month worth of, of data. And that's what every single one of these little different colored X's represents. That's every single time that phase one turned green. And you can see immediately there's a, there's a couple different patterns there. You can see the weekdays versus the weekends. You can see there was one particular week at the end of February where uh, the school probably wasn't in, in, in session. So we took a look at, at all this information. And we said, OK, well, there's, there's very clearly patterns where there's going to be people using that, that left turn lane. So we want to make sure that we still guarantee service for them. And we want to be able to target all, uh, you know, all, all the um, overnight hours uh, for this particular school signal. So we, we defined business hours for this particular signal as anything between 6 AM and 10 PM. So we wanted to target with a particular strategy any, any calls that came into this left turn lane between 10 PM and 6 AM, which is all of the X's marked in red. So we have quite a few instances of this left turn light that's switching to green at 2, 3, 4 in, in the morning when it may not be necessary, especially considering we had flashing yellow operations there as well. So the solution was fairly, fair, fairly simple. Um, I want to focus on just the data element. But ultimately, what we, we did is we put in a time of day based delay onto that particular detector so that someone actually had to be sitting at that particular uh, uh, left turn light for more than a couple seconds to guarantee service. Putting that delay in for only those specific hours of the day would allow us to have um, the normal op operations and service that uh, the users of the signal had come to expect throughout business hours, and we were able to target those uh, over overnight hours um, actuations. Do the same kind of study uh, about a month later, um, and we were down from 150 instances in those overnight hours down to 11. Again, the situation is very simple. The solution is very simple. But what this is showing us is this is a data-driven approach to identifying what the problem is. The problem was a systemic issue that was continuously occurring. And we were and the solution that we implemented had an overall positive effect. Now, what, what these 11 instances that are still there may be, it was somebody sitting there long, long enough to trigger the detection beyond that delay. So they may have needed that particular left turn light to turn green. What you're doing at a school signal with those hours, I don't know, and you know what, that's okay. We're gonna go ahead and skip over that, that part as well. But we were ultimately able to improve that service overall for that southbound movement because we reduced the number of northbound left turn actuations. A Couple other elements of how we can use this data. Um, I talked a lot about correlating when we have a vehicle arriving at a signal and comparing it to the state of that particular signal as well, whether it was red, green, or yellow. We can ultimately tally all that up and I can see I may have 7,658 vehicles arriving on green versus a total of uh, 17,405, let's say. Well, I can turn that into a simple percentage and I can say X percent of vehicles arrived at this signal heading southbound on green. 
So here's, a, here's an example from um, one of our Centrax systems we have at the Maryland State Highway Administration. Uh, for this particular intersection, MD2 at uh, an, uh, an, an Annapolis Harbor uh, for Wednesday, June 12, 2019, I had 17,000 vehicles uh, turn on that particular detector. 7,800 of them uh, turned on that detector when the signal was green for an overall AOG of 45%. For a visual element, this is what we see on an hour by hour approach. In those early morning hours, those two curves are exactly the same. You can see they start to split out more and more throughout, throughout the day. And this is where I start to see the, dis the discrepancy between traffic that actually is at that signal versus how, how much traffic we're actually able to serve with a green light. If I'm the traffic operations engineer and I see this, I know that first off, we're only looking at uh, southbound traffic so far, but what I see is whatever operations I've got in these midday hours here is what I'm going to want to want to target. That's where I see the biggest gap between my total vehicles that arrived compared to my vehicles that arrived on green. So I start to set that aside and say, what can I do to improve operations there? But before we do that, we want to do a quick check. Because this information is at such a high level of detail, we can see this play out for both the southbound as well as the northbound approach for this particular signal. So what does northbound look like? Same day, same intersection, same time, um, but I see that the curves are much, much closer together. If I'm the outside consultant, then I may conclude that this particular corridor may have at one point employed a northbound oriented progression strategy based on whatever the traffic pattern was at the time. I can see, however, though, I have 15,991 vehicles that um, I traveled in the northbound approach, which is actually less than, than what my south, southbound vehicle amount was for the, for the, for the same day. So the Overall traffic pattern on this particular intersection, on this particular corridor, has changed since the last time uh, MS, MSHA wanted to reevaluate their overall progression strategy for this particular road. This data shows that. So I can see that overall, our northbound progression actually looks pretty dang good. We're at 70% of vehicles arriving on green, but you compare that to the 49% we have for southbound. So now you can start to ask the question, how do we want to balance not only that midday pattern, but how do we kind of balance throughout the entire day the vehicles that I have arriving both northbound and southbound to kind of get to that bi-directional pro uh, progression approach? Let's zoom in a little bit more. Um, this is, uh, again, same day, same intersection. Uh, we see a couple of the different fundamental elements here. I can see in those early morning hours, just like we had on the, on, on the uh, graph before, that red line spikes quite a bit because I don't have a fixed force off point. Um, you compare that to the uh, traffic patterns throughout throughout the day, where we have that flat red line, and I can tell with that downward spike um, that that occurs, for example, at 9 a.m. and at 2:30 p.m., um, that's when I'm changing patterns. So overall, just from looking at this graph, I can see how it's managing traffic and what my current operations are. And as I had mentioned before, we kind of want to start to circle in on what those midday hours are. So now I know that pattern two is probably the one that I wanted to start to adjust op operations at. That's where I'm suffering the most. If I kind of zoom in here a little bit, we can now see even, even more detailed information. Again, each of those black dots represents a single vehicle arriving. So at the bottom of that curve is the beginning of our red, and you measure that length of red all the way up to that green curve. So if we take a look at the data really zoomed in, those black dots at the bottom of that callout are waiting the entirety of the cycle until they get a green light again. So now we can also start to take a look at what our delay is, uh, how many vehicles are being stopped, and for how long they're getting stopped. And now we can really start to ask those questions, how, if at all, do we want to fix op op operations here? Now you can also compare how does your pattern two work versus your pattern one or your pattern three or your, or your pattern four. Do you want to adjust where your free mode hours are? Maybe, maybe we want to push it back by 30 minutes. Maybe we want to push it forward by, by one hour. This gives you such an in-depth look at what this signal is doing that you can really start to ask those very detailed questions, which allows us to get to the exact um, issue at hand, which is how do we improve traffic for the motor and public? Um, I talked about stop bar detection. Um, this gets into the split monitor and split failure reports. Um, what we have here is now using that stop bar based detection to understand every single phase of the intersection. Did that phase, did it gap out? Did it force off or did it max out? And obviously those are dependent on whether we are running free mode operations or we are running uh, time-based co 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 coordination. Uh, the dots in green are every time we forced off, we use the entirety of the split. The blue dots represent every time we gap out. Um, and uh, the max out represents every time that we uh, use the, the entirety of the green time allocated during free mode. This is now for phase one, same day, same intersection. If I'm taking a look at what my AOG graph looks like, and I'm taking a look at what my Purdue coordination uh, graph looks like, I may have decided, 
okay, yes, I want to improve operations for pattern two, which then leads me to, okay, I need to find time from some other split that I can take so that I can add additional time to that uh, uh, southbound movement. So where am I gonna take that time from? That's where this information can really come in, come in handy because now I can see, okay, which of my actuated side street phases and my, and my, and my left turn phases do I think is maybe I can steal a couple seconds away with and not adversely affect conditions there. What I'm seeing from phase one here is I have a fair amount of green dots in those midday hours. So this probably isn't a particularly good situation. Uh, if we circle those here, I've got maybe 50-50, maybe 60-40 maybe, maybe dis dis distribution between cycles in which I'm gapping out, that's the blue dot, and cycles in which I'm forcing off, that's the green dot. So this probably isn't a very good uh, phase in which we want to steal five, seven seconds away from. Let's take a look at phase four, however. Phase four, we see a vast uh, greater number of uh, cycles in which we've gapped out. We have very, very few force offs. So what I'm seeing here is, okay, whatever my phase four split is, maybe we can afford to take three or five or seven seconds away. And let's, let's put it back on, on the uh, mainline co coordinated phase. Let's see what happens. So now I've been able to specifically identify what the problem is and what the solution is all by using this data. A couple other situations. How about in our regular maintenance routines? Again, this is a very detection heavy type concept, which means that we need to also be on the ball as far as understanding how our detection system is currently operating. Um, I'm gonna continue to pick on my friends at the Maryland State Highway Administration. Um, and I wanna call out now April 22nd of last year, um, uh, same in intersection. So we've seen before what this, this inter in intersection runs is four separate patterns throughout, th throughout the day and free mode in the early morning hours and the late night hours. But there's a difference for this particular day. I can see that I have that normal uh, crazy spiky red line in those early morning hours, but something's changing a little bit in those late evening hours. What we're ultimately seeing is that that, that, that red curve is occurring much more consistently. In other words, you can kind of translate that to we're not dwelling in green there anymore. Therefore, if we're not dwelling in green on our coordinated phase, something is continuously calling a side street phase. So what, do we, what, what kind of issue do we, do we, do we have there? If we take a look a couple of days later, we can see that now it's occurring in both the morning and the evening hours. So now I see that I have a consistent view of we're not dwelling in green on our coordinated phase. Well, perhaps this is some kind of broken detector. Um, it could be that there was some particular event, but if it's still happening two days later in both morning and evening hours, that's extremely unlikely. What other information can we glean from this? Let's take a look at an, 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 another view where we're just gonna measure what is our green time look like at this particular intersection for our phase two southbound approach. Well, I can see on Monday, April 22nd, 2019, uh, at one point we, we uh, dwelled in green at 3.30 in the morning for 559 seconds. So I know that I'm typically expecting a very, very long dwell time in our coordinated phase, and we don't have a lot of activity on our side streets. If suddenly, mysteriously, we do, there's probably something going on with our equipment. So how can we identify the problem? Let's go back to that. Um, split monitor type uh, information here. Same day, I can see that we have a uh, almost exclusively blue dots in those early morning hours. Uh, those are all my gap outs. But once we've gone back to free mode in those uh, late evening hours, they're all black dots indicating we're now maxing out at a very, very fixed time. To me, this indicates we now have, we have identified that my detection system is now throwing a constant call every single cycle and we need to get our technician out there to get it fixed. Well, let's make that call. Uh, guy, guy goes out there, resets the, uh, the uh, loop detector. Let's check in a couple days, days later. Did that fix stay? Um, and have we overall solved the issue? We can see now, uh, Monday, April 20, 29th, a week later, we're back to what our, our normal operations look like. So we were able to use all of this data to identify we have a stuck detector. And now I can immediately translate that to, hey, um, I need my maintenance staff to get out there and reset this particular loop de detector. And we've been able to confirm that that was in fact the issue. Let's take it a little bit further though. Let's go into a concept called link pivot. Let's, let's talk about real-time adaptive control. And ultimately what this does is um, the brilliant folks down at Purdue wanted to build on their concepts and see if they could establish a way to optimize a corridor um, using some of the high resolution ATSPM concepts that they had already built. So what we see here is um, from a, a very, very smart gentleman by the name of Chris Day came up with this uh, concept of let's take a look at when we have vehicles arriving, and let's take a look at how long those green uh, lights are throughout an entire uh, a day worth of um, uh, cycles. Uh, and those are the first two graphs at the top. 
let's kind of organize that raw data a little, little bit more and let's convert understanding how long we've been green at a particular signal throughout a day. Let's turn that into a pro probability. How likely is this direction going to be green at a certain time of day in a certain part of the cycle? Let's also compare that to how often do I have vehicles arriving at a certain part of my cycle as well? And that's what that graph on, uh, in the bottom right looks like. If you combine those two, you get the graph at the far bottom, where now we're combining, I now know when I am most likely to be green based on the performance of my detection system and my current configurations. And I can compare that to when am I having the most vehicles arrive in that particular cycle? And what this does is this is going to not only confirm are my current um, analysis uh, showing that I am capturing the majority of, of, of vehicles based on how my detection is currently running, and are there any changes I want to make as far as when I'm green through a particular cycle? What this ultimately boils down into then is using a lot of math, and I promise I never want to give math over a lunch hour, uh, but we're ultimately looking at a bi-directional optimization method using these types of concepts. We know the probability of when we're going to be green. We know what the vehicle arrivals look like. Can we put that into an algorithm where we can take a look and see what we can do to optimize our cycle length? our split time, our offset time, so on and so forth. Uh, Chris, Chris Day's initial research wanted to look at just that offset op, op, optimization. Um, we've, we've, we've kind of expanded that into looking at both the cycle length as well as the uh, split time parameters as well. Um, the way that, without getting too much into, into detail, um, the way that the algorithm works is by taking a look at if we have a corridor of four intersections, we want to optimize that timing based on those prob probabilities at intersection one lock that in and now go down to in intersection two. And now we have a new baseline. We're going to, we're going to fix things at intersection two, do a quick check back at intersection one. Does this, does this work? Yes or no. And then move on to three and then move on to four and then work your way all the way back up, back up the chain. Ultimately to kind of summarize this without getting again, too heavy into the details here, what, whatever timing parameters we have that seems to work at four, that still has to work all the way back at um, inter, in, uh, intersection one. And that's kind of the general idea behind this here. We factor this into um, all of this data, all of this information. Again, going back to that initial goal, of we want to be able to help agencies invest in technology that's going to allow them to become more proactive instead of reactive. Well, part of that proactive strategy could also be making recommendations for what our timing parameters can look like. So pulling uh, from our uh, uh, Centrax SPM interface, our pattern optimizer kind of looks like, like this. So top left, I can see that Medlock Bridge Road at Wilson Road is currently programmed to have an 84 second offset and 140 second cycle length. And there's what my ring and barrier diagram looks like. Based on that link pivot algorithm, everything on the right that's high, high, highlighted in yellow is what we're recommending you change. If I'm the traffic engineer sitting at the TOC, I'm gonna look at this and go, okay, that's nice, but I need to have a lot of more information. I, I, I need to make sure that I understand why it's suggesting a cycle length of 150 instead of 140, why the offset is eight, why phase one is going to a 14 second, so on and so forth. And that's where those graphs come into play. So we're able to show you with the first graph on the left, what our current conditions are. We see that gray, gray curve showing how many vehicles I have arriving at this particular intersection. And that green box is my current green band. So based on recommendations, we go to the middle graph. Well, let's go ahead and slide all that over and maybe widen that band a little bit as well. If you look at the one on the far right, again, this is a detection-based system. So the more that we can take advantage of that, the more understanding we have, the more accurate we can be. So now we can see based on um, times in which this signal has returned to green early on the coordinated phase, this is what that probability curve looks like now. So as the traffic engineer, if you combine that middle graph with that far right graph, you can start to understand exactly where we are going to be able to capture the highest amount of traffic. If you do this type of review, you do this intersection by intersection, and I've joked with our developers that for our interface here, I really do think there should be like a big red cartoonish button that says launch. Unfortunately, it's just a little blue box that says apply. But ultimately, you can do this type of review for your entire corridor and push all these changes to the field. What that's allowed us to do then is now take advantage of all these high, high resolution concepts. We understand all of the operational issues and challenges we have. We've been able to address any kind of maintenance issues. And now we're going to impact the timing based on this data as well. That gets us then into adaptive. A uh, term I'm sure many of you have heard at this point. but what eAdaptive does is now take that review process, that pattern optimization process, let's do it live. So where the pattern optimizer is going to take a look at analysis based on um, you know, a month's worth of data or two weeks worth of data or even a single week's worth of data and then generate those rec recommendations based on that historical record. 
Um, what we can do then is we can now start to do that live. Let's take a look at that optimization based on the last couple of cycles. Are there changes we want to make? So now we have a real time um, effort into continuously re-optimizing what our patterns look like. We don't have to throw away all, all the work we've done into understanding what traffic patterns and what cycles and what capabilities are in our current traffic network, but we want to make it a little bit more dynamic and continuously optimize that. That's where eAdaptive come, come, comes, comes into play. I want to highlight a case study for that. Does this actually work? You know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of math, there's a lot of moving parts that go into this. So again, uh, my my dear dear friends at the Maryland State Highway Administration, they wanted to deploy eDaptive on uh, the same corridor uh, in which the uh, data I've, I've been showing you from. So those four dots on the left, uh, the three blue dots and the one yellow dot, that's our current corridor. That is the Maryland two corridor. Uh, that is where we currently um, are. As of this case study in 2019, we had four intersections connected to our Centrax SPM and eDaptive system. What we wanted to do is they said, okay, we really like the data that we're getting out of this. We, we like the pattern optimizer. We want to move to be, to be eDaptive. So just a quick review of what that project and, de and deployment looked like. This was all done in July of 2019. So for we basically did a, a very staggered approach into deploying those eDaptive operations. So first we said, okay, go ahead and control this entire corridor for just an hour. Let's take a look at how that how, how that works. And we, we, we wanted to be very careful and very deliberate about this. Um, if you look at the map on the right, those two northernmost signals uh, involve interstate rents. So obviously, we, can, we need to be particularly sensitive if we do have any kind of queue building up that could potentially create a dangerous situation in the free-flowing traffic on that freeway if we uh, backed up off of, off of the ramp. So let's just go ahead and take this step-by-step, step, slowly build things up here. Ultimately, we, we wanted to observe adaptive operations. We had folks um, out on, uh, in the field at each of these intersections. Um, myself here in Detroit, I was uh, uh, observing what our interface looked like, and we had our support team out in Col 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 Colorado Springs taking a look. At the end of each day, we would, we would check in with the team at, at MSHA, report what, what, what we saw, make any kind of changes as they felt comfortable or appropriate. Eventually, over about two weeks or so, we were able to build up from just a single hour of control all the way to the designated parameters that MSHA wanted this corridor to run adaptive operations from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. That was done by the end, of, the end of July. So my question, because I asked too many questions as a traffic engineer, I wanted to see, was this actually effective? So I took a look at two sets of data and did a very, very simple before after comparison. I went back to a week's worth of data in June of last year before we did anything with the pattern optimizer, before we did anything with eDaptive at all whatsoever. And I wanted to pull the information, what does our arrival on green percentages look like in the northbound and southbound coordinated approaches for this entire corridor? And you can see that that in the top left curve uh, or, or graph table rather, excuse me, all of those numbers for June indicates we haven't done anything but start to collect data. In August is when we had fully adaptive operations between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And I just wanted to see, did our arrival on green percentages go up or down? And you can see, uh, especially where I've got the red circles, we had fairly substantial improvement at the arrival on green percentages for some of these interior intersections. Um, the PM peak pattern eight, where we see two of those down red arrows, if you take a look at exactly what those numbers are, overall we had a decrease of about 2% at two of my intersections um, compared to the increase of upwards of you know, 13 to 14% that I was seeing at some of my other in intersections. We're talking about trade-offs. If I have to trade off approximately 2% of vehicles arriving on, on, on green for the benefit that the entire system sees, overall, I believe this is a, a su su success and an indicative of a strategy that may be feasible and warranted for this particular corridor. Ultimately, what are some lessons we learned from this particular deployment? Um, again, I, I didn't go into the equipment piece a whole lot, but communications and detection equipment are absolutely critical for a system like this because we're continuously changing timing parameters on those on those controllers. We're continuously updating um, what those uh, uh, charts and what that data looks like. We need to make sure we have that stream of, of information coming in continuously. Um, ultimately, the pattern optimizer is going to provide a path to week over week corridor improvement. While the eDaptive can control day to day operations, we want to make sure that our goalposts are in as best of a position as possible. And if we permanently change what those patterns look like based on the recommendations we get out of the pattern optimizer, that's going to give us a better and better result each time until we can really zoom into what is most appropriate for this particular corridor. And then lastly, the biggest adaptive improvements we saw were actually on those interior intersections. And when I say that, the way that the link pivot algorithm ultimately works is it's, it's looking at that bi-directional approach. So whatever two intersections I have on the outermost um, def, uh, of, of, of my corridor, we're only able to do that op optimization in one particular direction. 
So the more intersections we have attached to a particular corridor, um, then we can get more of those intersections looking at that bi-directional optimization. So a potential question that I did have as a result of that is maybe when we are setting up one of these high resolution based adaptive systems, my two endpoints should be minor signals. That way, if we just have a very you know, quiet neighborhood signal that we don't want to worry about operations too much, and that's adjacent to a much larger you know, um, Main Street at First Street type um, you know, intersection, we want to be able to improve Main at First much, much more so than that quiet neighborhood in, um, intersection. So a couple, couple good, good things we were, we were able to get out of that study overall. Ultimately, closing thoughts on this. That's a mouthful. There's a lot. Again, if it wasn't clear by now, I am a huge traffic geek. But ultimately, a couple of questions we can ask ourselves, especially if we take a look back at the results of that 2020 survey. Number one, how can an agency improve signal operations when faced with resource constraints? In my opinion, it's SPM, because now I can have an interface in which I take a look at all of this data and I can find a lot of different answers to it. How can an agency determine how efficiently their signals are operating? SPM is the answer. I take a look at the arrival on green percentage. I take a look at the Purdue coordination diagram. I can determine if my patterns are effective or not. How can an agency determine which signals will benefit from retiming? Signal performance metrics can be the answer to that, especially if I take a look at things over time. If I start to see some of my patterns that maybe a couple of years ago, they worked fantastic. I can see how that trend is occurring throughout the years until I have more vehicles running on red than I do on green. And lastly, how can an agency automate the signal retiming process? Even if you don't want to go the full adaptive approach, having that signal performance metrics ATSPM platform as your fundamental cornerstone of what the system looks like, that's where we can get into retiming our signals at a much more frequent rate than we, than we used to. And that's all I got. That's a mouthful, um, but I'd love to entertain any questions if you, if you guys have any. So Josh, I want to thank you for this amazing presentation. Um, I have been getting feedback on my phone and through email throughout the presentation from various people on the call. So thank you very much for presenting. Um, I'd like, you know, again, it's open for questions. If you'd like to unmute yourself, feel free to do so and ask Josh directly, or if you'd like to kind of type in your questions in the chat box. Uh, I see Tom saying great presentation right now, but again, if you have any specific questions or if you'd like to kind of clarify anything, uh, now's your chance. And I'm, of course, always available by phone and, and um, email if you guys would like to uh, um, so discuss. I, I, have, I have a question for you, uh, yeah. for you, Josh. I noticed that you were looking at the uh, granular data uh, and your, actually your name was on the development uh, for, that, uh, for that document, the updated document for 2020. Because I remember in 2012, there was also a basic one. And I think this is probably like the updated version of it. If you don't mind going back to that slide. Um, are there any available tools to uh, interpret that data from that single line uh, output to something useful in terms of getting the timing? And I, I like the, your slide where you're showing what the data looks like. And then in, in a couple of slides down, you're showing the green time, red time, and how you know the occurrences happened. And that would be slide 13. Um, so do you, are there any available tools uh, open source tools that can help us translate the data from the way it comes out in in uh, slide 10 or 12 to how it you know we can use it in uh, slide 13. Um, open source makes that a tricky question to answer. Um, and of course, I'm going to give you the most engineering answer possible, which is it depends, right? Um, there's a there's a couple of different ways in which we can capture some of this information. Um, the first use case example that I went into, and let me go down to the slides. Um, these charts here um, were actually derived from the Centrax ATMS system, which only records information at a second by second, level, as opposed to that 10th of the second level that gets into the high resolution data. But you can see a lot of the value that we can get out of that just by having some kind of system that's able to record this type of information for us. So if we have an agency that has an existing ATMS, chances are there's some type of report or some type of data that we can glean that's gonna allow us to do this type of um, analysis. We look at specific open source systems. Um, if you're familiar with Utah DOT, they uh, wanted to make their own version of a Linux-based open source high-resolution system. Um, uh, the, the 
the capabilities of it are are very impressive, but there's a lot that goes into setting up how to capture all of that data in particular. Um, I mean, you, I, for me, for me personally, I could not program my way out of a card, cardboard box. So I take a look at trying to set up a Linux-based system, and I'm looking at hier hieroglyphics for for me personally. Um, so just depending on what tools we have available, whether that's an existing ATMS, if we want to take a look at a uh, high resolution data data platform, those are two solutions. And we can also take a look at what logs we can get out of the controllers themselves. Um, before we had these uh, database platforms, um, there was a there was an, an, an effort at Purdue uh, to start to store a lot of this information on a little ras Raspberry Pi device that would just basically be a hard drive sitting in the, in the traffic cabinet. And it would uh, export all that high resolution data from the controller onto that hard drive. And then you have to take that back, go through that high, high, high res data yourself, and then really start to filter through exactly what you wanted, wanted to do. So there's a couple different tools. None of them are an easy mode um, when we when we kind of get into the open source and you know um, you know older type technology. Ho hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from from our attendees? So with. No other questions, unless I get interrupted with a question, please feel free to do so. Again, Josh, I want to say thanks again for presenting on this. Uh, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I, I was getting text messages and, um, and emails kind of with people inquiring about certain things. So there's a very, a lot of interest in the slides themselves. Uh, would you like to maybe pr provide us with a slide deck that we can share with our, uh, with our uh, attendees and our members? Yeah, I'd be I'd be more than happy to. I'll I'll, I'll try to package this up into a P, P, PDF that isn't broken by some of the animations that I have, and I'll I'll, I'll send that your way, Tony. Excellent. And I, I would also try to probably put that PDF with the YouTube uh, upload that we're going to be creating, so you guys can actually um, watch the video and look at the slides from that same link. And I want to encourage all our um, attendees and all our members to please follow us. Go to our website, see what's going on. Stay involved. A newsletter goes out um, uh, quite regularly, and it does include a lot of good information. And uh, please follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and now on YouTube. Um, we have all the latest information and sharing all that good stuff. So thank you very much again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar in the next uh, year in 2021. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity.